out in the afternoon to join us for this occasion. Um, I remember a fantasy about what life would be like as an academic, where I would read and write and share ideas with colleagues, and we would swap reading lists and actually read what was on our friends' reading lists and learn things from entirely different perspectives. And oh, yeah. So one of the um, great privileges of uh, directing the Humanities Center and Lori Lefkowitz um, is that the Humanities Center actually affords a select number of people um, the opportunity to do that. Uh, this fellows program is exactly that. It draws upon colleagues um, across the university, across ranks, graduate students, junior faculty, senior faculty, who are working together on a theme topic, each pursuing his or her own avenue of research and sharing reading lists and taking things in surprisingly new directions. The theme for this year, viral culture, um, I remember when a virus was not a good thing, and when something went viral, you should, um, you know, worry about quarantine. And now viral has upended itself uh, definitionally, and we've been talking a lot about that. So I won't say much more about um, the folks from whom you will hear today in the first of three opportunities um, to hear, uh, to to have a, open the window on the conversations that we have been having in the fellows group. What we have been doing is um, discussing shared readings, um, listening to one another's uh, papers, and preparing for occasions like this. Um, three of our seven uh, fellows will present today, and then we will have two and two. The other dates are here at the back of your program. The um, very brief, um, sketchiest biographical details of our distinguished colleagues are also here. I will say their names. Um, we will hear first from uh, <coughs> Susanna Walters, who's the Director of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and is Professor of Sociology. Justin, Justin Mangerinas is an Assistant Professor in the Health Sciences Department. Ryan C Cordell is my colleague in English and um, is big in this new lab, Digital Humanities stuff. Uh, all of them are brilliant. Um, and I will, in, in a moment, turn the floor over to Susanna, but first I'd like to introduce Tim Cresswell, who is the Associate Director of the Humanities Center, also newly appointed relatively, yeah. and uh, in particular, with particular mandate to do public humanities. Very good to see you all. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about next year. Um, we are going to be running the same scheme, and um, the theme for that scheme is going to be space and place, which has a lot to do with me. Mm -hmm has to be said. Um, and, and, and connecting that hopefully to sort of outward reaching ways in which the Humanities Centre can talk to the Boston community at a wider level. And this, this, this theme will be something that hopefully will bring in people from, from within the Humanities and Social Sciences, but also outside of them, outside of particular, um, that particular domain, because people in science, or people in art and design and stuff can relate to it as well. And it really speaks to um, the, a kind of growing awareness of spatial thinking. Um, and the idea of place across disciplines. There's this been, been talk of something called spatial humanities or geo humanities, connecting some of the stuff in um, digital humanities that's fairly evidently spatial to um, perhaps more traditional things, uh, thinking about <coughs> spatial history, for instance, thinking about um, the role of place in literature, um, thinking about um, how architects are dealing with the ways in which the places we're going to live in in the future will um, be, be more hospitable or less hospitable to us, more secure or less secure, more healthy, less healthy, to use some of the key themes from the university. So um, so that's a sort of sneak preview of that, and obviously there will be, there'll be a call out there for people to become fellows um, reading um, uh, and doing presentations like this in a year from now, as well as um, some postgraduate fellows. So we get to get to that. Great. And so if anyone wants to speak more broadly about space and place geo humanity stuff, then I'm happy to do that as well, because I have a kind of longer term plan to um, get an interdisciplinary postgraduate program going in spatial humanities. Yeah, so you're the first to hear of this yeah. theme and uh, think about how you might want to participate. Susanna, this game is yours. Okay, um, I, I, let me just say that this is, I think for all of us, this is. Um, a work in progress. 
Uh, and I'm <coughs> going to be doing it because um, I've just recently finished a book and this has nothing to do with it. So this is really nice, although it's really depressing. Um, anyway, so what am I talking about here? I am interested here in, and you see the image here about Steubenville, about questions about the relationship between sexuality, gender, and social media, particularly in relation to sites in which the body and identity itself is at issue, um, sexual identity and sexual violence in this case. So I'm looking at, uh, I, and I'm not 100% sure I'm going to stick only with these sites. Um, I probably will expand because, uh, unfortunately, there are lots of them. Uh, but right now I'm looking at three locations. One is the Steubenville rape case, which I, I assume most of you are aware of, a 2012 case um, in which um, two high school uh, football players were accused and, and tried of uh, raping a, a, a passed out and intoxicated 16-year-old um, girl. And that happened in 2012. The Delhi rape case uh, also happened in 2012. Uh, and uh, this is a gang rape case um, where a young woman was uh, taken into a bus and, uh, and raped over several hours brutally and uh, died from her injury. And um, so it became, ended up becoming both a, a rape and murder case. You can see why I'm totally depressed by this. And the <coughs> It Gets Better Anti-Bullying Project, which was started earlier, which was started in 2010 um, by gay writer Dan Savage. Uh, when he posted it, he did a, him and his partner did this YouTube video um, that became this huge uh, viral event. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, uh, and, and I just should say, with both the Steubenville and Delhi rape case, there were convictions in both cases, um, which is an interesting phenomenon. But I'm interested in how sexual and, and you know, the relationship between sexual and gender violence and sexual identity and social media. And partly because these are phenomenon, both sexual violence and gender identity and sexual identity are understood to be phenomenon deeply intimate and profoundly social at the same time. Both have prompted political movements and singular narrative strategies. So for example, consciousness raising and telling truth confessionals and the coming out story um, in terms of gay life. Both are also marked by shame and objection. The fear that constructs the closet, the shame that sexual assault provokes. So what happens then when circulation publicizes that which has been hidden? And that's sort of my question here. And I have a bunch of questions. Well, I have many questions, no answers. But let me give you some of the questions or things I'm interested in addressing with this project. How do our normative and hegemonic narratives of sexual identity and sexual assault shift in an era of virality? To what extent does virality enable new and transforming responses to these issues? I'm particularly interested here actually in how the mode of virality does or does not change the narrative arc of sexual identity and sexual violence. Are different stories being told because they're being told this way? Wow. Different stories than the stories, you know, the older coming out stories or the older, you know, sort of narratives of, uh, about sexual violence, either in memoirs, either in, uh, you know, it take, it get, you know um, take Back the Night marches. How are these things different? Uh, are they different? Do they use different ways of storytelling? Do, this, do these new circulations differ from those of earlier generations, both in their narrative structures and in the political and social responses of citizens and state actors? Does watching boys brag about rape while the seemingly unconscious victim is displayed change the national discourse? Even at a moment, and this happened at the same moment in which there was an attempt to defund the Violence Against Women Act. It didn't happen, but uh, it was an interesting convergence of events. How does the recirculation of these images and their reconfiguration in tweets and blogs shape the discourse? How does the very mode of the viral the instantaneous and recombinant transmission of images and meaning shape a topic. How does the tangibility of gendered violence, sexual violence, the violence of homophobia and anti-gay bullying upon the gendered, raced, and class body play out when it becomes a viral repetition? So does the injured body become a meme? What happens to embodiment in moments when it, the social media event captures the experience and recirculates it. Why, of course, another question, why do these particular events go viral? Why these? Unfortunately, women are raped all the time, brutally. Gay kids are bullied all the time, 
brutally. Why, why these things? Why at this moment? So I guess part of the question I'm asking, you know, sort of I can put them in two, two categories. One is how does viral circulation affect affect? Right? How does it affect affect? But also how does it structure social and legal responses? And that's one of the most interesting things I found in the, the little bit I found already uh, in the difference between Steubenville and the Dellen case is, is, is in the question of effect. So Steubenville, let me go to Steubenville now. So this, is, this case is one in which social media matter most vividly. The very crime would never have been known, even it seems by the victim, if the perpetrators and onlookers hadn't documented it and spread it online through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and text. In other words, when she, uh, after she came home or was dropped home after the assault, she didn't know what happened to her. She had no idea. So the only way she found out about it was the circulation uh, that these boys had documented various aspects of it, and onlookers had documented various aspects of it, and had posted these as Instagram images, uh, and then she and then she she found them and you know realized that something had happened. And the Stuberville case, therefore, was mediated from the very moment of the assault. Uh, as I said, there was this Instagram photo that I think most of you have probably seen of the past girl, uh, passed out girl being held up by the legs and arms by her two assailants which was circulated and recirculated. There was a 12 minute video from the night of the assault which, in which uh, various classmates, other uh, football players were referring to her as dead and mocking her and mocking the assault. And there are text messages from witnesses and the assailants and the victim. Then it gets even more mediated and more viral. An offshoot of the uh, hacker group Anonymous got involved and they're the ones, in fact, who leaked that 12-minute uh, video that showed the drunk boys joking about the assault. And most sort of um, contentiously, a crime, a local cr crime, crime blogger, I mean, that's sort of, she focused on crime, uh, Alexandria Goddard, posted and, and took screenshots of the tweets before they were removed and deleted from the accounts. But actually, one of the things that's interesting that I found out about the Steubenville case that I hadn't realized when I started looking at it in terms of, of how it's been understood is that we tend to now look at this as, as a moment the social media made. As a, now, and in some ways, that's true. I mean, the social media did sort of make this and recirculate it. Um, but actually, yeah, um, what happened, the order of events was, was a little, you wouldn't, re you wouldn't recognize the, order, the actual order of events from how it is later portrayed by the media. So the order of events sort of went like this. Um, the parents went to the police two days after the attack. So the, the first order was actually this parental intervention. They saw the tweets, they saw the Instagram image through the daughter. They then took this flash drive to the cops uh, containing the photographs, screenshots of the tweets, and this video, um, this 12 minute video. Then, so that was the first moment is that the parents went. Then this blogger, Goddard, got involved. Then, and, and started, you know, uh, sort of putting pressure on the police. Then there, was a big New, then there was a big New York Times piece in December. This happened in August. And then the anonymous group um, got involved. So the anon anonymous got involved after the police had already arrested them, after the police, after the parents had gone in, after the blogger had done it, and after <coughs> the New York Times did it. But it's, in fact, not how you would understand uh, most of how it's been talked about, I think. Uh, and then there was the Occupy Steubenville rallies that occurred later on. So the rallies were the end, the end point of it. Uh, the boys were actually arrested August 22nd, very soon after the incident. Um, and it, it, there, are, uh, there are a number of things I want to I wanna talk about here. One was, and I, I think this is probably the most upsetting for, uh, and, and the most different from the, um, the case in Delhi, was that, uh, during the trial, there was a, so there was all this media circulation that went on before um, pressure from the, this blogger to you know act on it and, and a lot of organizing around it. But most of the of the media circulation actually occurred during um, the trial, when the blogosphere and Twitter in particular um, lit up in uh, antagonism towards the victim. Uh, so the victim blaming. Got, got enormous. Um, when outrage, while outrage circulated, what circulated even more powerfully was victim blaming and misogyny. And let's see, this is from the Steubenville, um, from the rally. This is, this is um, 
the op, op roll, red roll is uh, the hackers. That's what Anonymous did. Printified is the blog from the um, Alexandria Goddard, who, was, who had lived in Steubenville before, so that's part of how, how she got involved in it. And these are some of the tweets. I have no sympathy for whores. I want to, there's lots of I want to kill you threats. And in fact, two girls were arrested after the trial for threats on, um, on the internet to the victim. Okay, this all happened to the victim. And then, of course, there was the response to it. There was also a huge other sort of iteration of this that occurred when, um, about the coverage in the mainstream media. I don't know if you remember, but there was a huge thing around CNN when Poppy Harlow was covering the trial and said, during the trial when they were found guilty, there are, and this is quoting her, there are two young men who had such promising futures, star football players, very good students, literally watched as they believed their life fell apart. So this it, it made a huge outrage. It was a change.org petition on it, um, uh, you know, to, to sort of get CNN to apologize because of these attacks. Um, and, and again, people got more involved. So, so what was notable here, I think, are, are two things. One, about this case. One is that the event itself came into light because of social media and viral circulation. Right? Because someone chose uh, uh, to document, uh, or as one, as one writer called it, you know, we now have a, live in a culture of live rape blogging. And because someone chose to document this, um, that actually got, it got made news. But the other part of it that's so striking is that the circulation of antagonism and vitriol towards the victim and the culture of victim blaming that went on and the attacks on the, on the young woman were, were actually the dominant kinds of tweets that went on during the trial and after. Okay, Delhi. So that was a cheery one. Delhi, another cheery one, also in 2012, where this woman, um, the 23-year-old woman, was gang raped on a private bus and then uh, died. Now this set off huge protests in India and abroad. And it's interesting because while social media uh, played a huge role in organizing the rallies and raising attention, it was different, the, the phenomenon was different from Steubenville and what happened in Steubenville in so many ways. First, the physical actions, the demonstrations were far greater than Steubenville. Now, some of this, I mean, there was the Occupy Steubenville rallies, but, but predominantly what went on in Steubenville was a lot of media circulation about it articles and you know, all of this stuff, but there wasn't actually a lot of physical protests. It was a small, uh, and it didn't last that long. Um, now, some of this, of course, is because it was so horrifically violent and the victim died from her injuries. But it also tapped into larger social movements in India in a way that the Steubenville case did not. Um, the women's movement, but also other workers' movements and so on. There were other, the other major difference, which was striking to me, is that when Steubenville happened, there was no, uh, there was no, there was no legal ramification. I mean, there was nothing that was done other than the social, uh, the social media outrage, both in support of the young woman and attacking her. What happened in India was that after the rape, the law was amended to make it more difficult to get off lightly. They widened the definition of rape. They provided for the death penalty. Whatever you think about that, in cases that caused the death of the victim, they created several new offenses, including sexual harassment. They set up six new special courts to handle and fast track rape cases in Delhi. So there was this huge legal, quite deliberate legal response. Um, this is just more of the stupid, though. Here's the Delhi. This legal response. What was also important to me to find is that the victim blaming almost, it was almost invisible. So this attack, now, is that because she's dead? Is that because it was so heinous? It's, uh, it's unclear to me. I, and, I'm, and I'm sort of looking at what, what are the, I mean, the, the, the responses were just hugely different. Um, these are just some of the internet responses here. And there's some evidence that, I mean, here the social media didn't capture the event and intervene as directly as it did with Steubenville but it played a huge role in political uh, mobilization 
Um, there was this Stop Right Now online petition. It was directed to the President and the Chief Justice. But almost all of the vitriol, and there was huge vitriol um, in, the, uh, in the Delhi case, almost all of it was directed towards uh, the perpetrators. And there were these celebrations. I mean, again, whenever you think about that, there were these celebrations when they were convicted. Now, I could say here, and this is um, um, more, again, that Google and India did. Okay. I would say that, that in some ways, I'm trying to figure out why the difference. Right? Part of what I'm trying to figure out is how did this circulate so differently? And is it just about, I mean, on the one hand, I say, well, it's because, is it because in our misogynist world, only a dead rape victim is seen truly as a victim? And I don't, I think there's some truth to that. That part of the reason uh, there wasn't an availability of a discourse of blame for the victim is because the victim was dead. Uh, but, but, but on the other hand, I actually think, you know, when you look at some other cases, I'm not sure that plays out. When you look at the case, for example, of uh, Larry King, uh, a queer uh, youth in California that was murdered by a classmate in 2008. Uh, in fact, and he was murdered, he's dead, right? In fact, a lot of the discourse around that was a discourse of blaming him. A lot of the reporting, a lot of the, you know, during the trial, sympathy, same kind of thing as you see in, in Steubenville, sympathy with the victim, um, I mean, with the perpetrator, and that Larry had brought it on himself by being so, non, so gender non-normative, and coming on to this boy. And so there was all of this sympathy for the perpetrator. And so that was, a, so um, you know, one of the things I begin to think is actually that this has something to do with US, <laughs> with US politics and culture. And part of what I'm finding with this, and, and part of the difference I see here, and to it, it, and I'll talk a minute about it, it gets better, is that the social media becomes the story, and the circulation and the virality became the story of the violence. Whereas with India, it, it is almost as if it became, it, it, it's sort of a means, not an end, right? It, beca it became a way to organize people in more, much more traditional social movement organizing, to get people out to rallies, to put pressure on the government to act, to put pressure on the government uh, to, uh, to, you know, to deal with uh, questions of misogyny and sexual violence more aggressively, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there was other stuff too, protectionist sort of discourse that was problematic. But it was as if the social media and, and, the, and the way in which it circulated was a tool that was distanced from its, uh, it, that didn't recirculate as the subject, right? When you look at Steubenville, and of course it gets better, the It Gets Better project as well, part of what I think happened with Steubenville and why you don't see more sort of social change emerging out of it or social movements being galvanized in a bigger way out of it is that it became the subject itself. So in fact, one of the biggest pieces written on the Steubenville case was written a really messed up piece in the New Yorker um, called uh, Trial by Twitter. So it, that, that in fact, the, the circulation, the social media aspect of it, the virality becomes the subject. And in fact, the victim becomes invisible again in a different sort of way. And, and the victim as a, a sort of social position and as women writ large, Become, and, and as embodied women writ large becomes invisible, which did not happen in India, which was interesting. Um, so that, um, now, the It Gets Better, do I have one more minute here? Um, the It Gets Better thing is complicated, because this, again, it started uh, in 2010 in response to anti-gay bullying and a wave of highly publicized gay teen suicides, and it became huge. Uh, there are now more than 50,000 user-created videos uh, seen over 50 million times. So we're talking virality on a whole other level here. Uh, it became the thing for celebrities and politicians to do, to make their own It Gets Better project. And of course there were spin-offs and debates about it. There was a Make It Better project uh, that became another circulating set of viral videos. We've Got Your Back project. And of course you can also buy It Gets Better bracelets at mm -hmm. Cafe Press. And I think, again, part of what's, what's different, let me show you a few <coughs> funny riffs on this. Okay. And I think part of, so, so I think part of what happened, what you see in the difference with this too, <laughs> is that, um, you know, it, it, the, it gets better fit perfectly into American progress narratives, right? You know, queerness is, is a problem that you can leave, a, the anti-gay homophobia, you know, you can leave it aside once you, once you become, a, you know, a, 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 queer, a queer adult. Um, and, it, you know, it get this whole thing, and in fact, the whole website 
is filled with, here are the markers of our progress. And again, I think that's some of what happened with the Steubenville thing. Now we are, that the story of capture, the, of the media talking about this becomes both the beginning and the end of the cycle of investigation. Whereas in the India case, it's just so radically, I mean, to me it was radically different in the way that it actually pushed, you know, it, it was, uh, it wasn't that the social media wasn't uh, engaged with it, but it was really um, in the sense of a, of a tool, uh, very analogous to other tools uh, we <coughs> had, had many years ago about getting the word out uh, about <coughs> it. it was not seen as an end in and of itself. Um, anyway, that's that's where I am with this. I, you know, I now I'm, I'm sort of looking at whether I'm going to investigate some of the other cases that have happened uh, in the U.S. in particular, alongside the. There's, you know, now does appear to be a phenomenon uh, of people recording on various forms of social media and posting very on various forms of social media uh, their attacks against women. Uh, and there was a case in was it Missouri, I guess, that was not too long after the one in Steubenville, which is, is scarily similar in terms of the the you know the desire by the perpetrators to in fact advertise uh, their crimes. Um, but the but again. You know how uh, it, I, I'm, I'm also interested in looking at some more cross-cultural comparisons because I find it, it, it the, the how it played out couldn't have been more different, and particularly this question of victim blaming, which seems so absent. Not absent, not absent in, in Indian culture writ large, but absent in this event, which is an interesting thing to look at. So, thank you. Oh, thank you. Conversation about work, works in progress is, of course, very important. We will defer conversation until after we hear all three talks so that um, we have the opportunity to, so everybody has time, and also we can have the opportunity to make some of these significant connections. That was so thought provoking. Thank you. I have lots of questions <laughs> and thoughts. Um, Ryan. Okay, so I'm going to. And uh, talk about a project. Some of you have heard me talk about this project before, but I'm going to be coming at it from a different angle than you've probably heard me talk about it before. Um, thinking about viral media back before the Civil War. So I'm, my scholarship is on American literature before the Civil War, and I'm interested in the ways that information circulated around the country at the time. And part of the reason why I'm excited to be part of this cohort is I've uh, been using these metaphors of viral media to describe the things that I study. And one of the things we've been thinking about as a group is really how uh, sufficient that, that metaphor is and in what ways it's useful and in what ways it's, it's not useful. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the reason why I sometimes uh, discuss the 19th century newspaper as a kind of proto-internet. Um, if you, we're in a place today, right, where we experience pretty much all the media that we experience through the same screen, right? Our music, our news, our uh, photographs, right? Everything is coming through the computer. And in some ways, the 19th century newspaper was itself an all-purpose medium. Uh, it didn't look like a modern newspaper in that it didn't just contain news. Uh, for a lot of people, it was their primary access to uh, any kind of textuality. Um, and it included, if you look at, this is just, I, I quite literally uh, picked uh, almost a random newspaper page from the data set that we've been working with. This is the Millbury Galaxy uh, from Vermont. And on this one page, we can see um, something that looks like news, right? This is a report of uh, uh, military activity. We have something that is an editorial. There are those who would sell the birthright of our nation's glory for a mess of official pottage. Right, this is a kind of a... Uh, Jacob of Esau. <laughs> there you go. But we also have a poem, mm -hmm. and a most 19th century newspapers would have printed poetry. Um, we also have a story. This is fiction, this is not news. And we also have this odd thing that they're calling an anecdote, which is a sort of quasi-news story that's neither true nor, nor untrue. <laughs> It's all on this one page, right? And this is uh, the primary sort of reading medium for many Americans during the period. 
And not only that, but this is before modern copyright law, so a lot of these little pieces circulated from newspaper to newspaper, um, sometimes with and sometimes without attribution. So you guys notice that uh, John Greenleaf Whittier poem in that first paper? Well, it appeared in lots of papers, sometimes with different titles. It, it went from being the Huskers to being the Corn Song. Uh, it had a few other names as well as it circulated. And there were really no restrictions on this kind of circulation. Things just got reprinted in paper after paper. Sometimes the titles would change. Sometimes the names of the authors would change. Uh, sometimes the text itself would change. And so this is the culture that I'm really interested in, this kind of circulation of texts around the country during the period. Scholars have written about this. Meredith McGill most, uh, most, uh, is probably the most well known for talking about this culture of reprinting, which she really says is at the heart of uh, 19th century textual practices. But actually sort of getting at this kind of reprinting in any sort of big way is really difficult in the archive, because basically what it means is you've got to just sit down and read all of the newspapers, right? And there are millions and millions of pages, and you've got to just index them as you go and compare them. And basically, it's, it's impossible to do. Uh, so I, uh, since getting to Northeastern, I've been working with David Smith in computer science uh, to develop uh, ways of automatically finding these reprinted texts in these huge historical archives that we have of newspapers. And this has been really successful so far. We've built an index of about 40,000 uh, reprinted texts, or what we've been calling viral texts, using just the Library of Congress's collections. It's actually not even, uh, not even a, the majority of 19th century newspapers. And most of these are things that scholars have never really looked at before, which is exciting to me. So what kinds of things went viral in the 19th century? There are recipes. I, I selected these because I actually, I sort of want you to be imagining what your Facebook feed looks like, right? <laughs> uh, for me, it's not dissimilar. There are recipes. This is to make your own starch for cleaning, uh, which I'm sure you're all going to run out and make your own gum Arabic starch uh, this evening. <coughs> there are lots of sort of... Uh, treacly exhortations to live better. Um, some of these are religious, some of these are not, right? But these are <coughs> inspirational messages that no doubt your aunt or uncle or someone posts on Facebook on a regular basis, or maybe your mom if she's on Facebook. Again, oh, oh also, uh, just like, oops, just like on the internet, there were lists. Lists are very popular. This is a list of maxims to guide a young man. These are all sort of principles that men should follow to be upright citizens. Right? Uh, think of the BuzzFeed list, right? And then 19 things you remember about the 80s or whatever. There were a lot of lists, actually, that went viral. Keep good company or none. <laughs> Keep good company or none, yes. <laughs> well, one of my favorites on this, without getting into the weeds, but it, it actually says, uh, if I can find it, have no very intimate friends. <laughs> there you go. This is yes. a lesson you can take away. Have no very intimate, intimate friends that want to be an upstanding person. Um, lots of religious messages, right? Uh, the the re uh, religious sentiment is, is very common in the 19th century newspaper. Oh, sorry, that's what we're going to zoom in. And then these, these sort of quasi-truthful things are actually really common. And actually, these remind me quite a bit of the things that you maybe get. At one time, they would have come via email. Now I think they come via Facebook, and you would immediately go to Snopes, <laughs> right? Your, I don't know, your right-wing uncle sent you this thing about how Obama is actually killing kittens or something, and you go to Snopes, that's really not true. Uh, anyway, you have a lot of these sort of vaguely sourced things. So what I've been thinking about and as part of this program is, okay, so how is this viral metaphor useful for thinking about these historical texts? And I think it is useful in certain ways, right? I think that it helps us to connect historical practices to modern information exchange. Uh, a lot of my work, a lot of my teaching is really invested in thinking about technology not as a recent phenomenon, but as something that human beings have been doing pretty much as long as we've been around. And I like to make these sorts of connections, both in my teaching and my research. Um, viral is a kind of organic metaphor to describe organic exchange. So later in the 19th century, you get these sort of formalized systems of exchange, like the AP, the Associated Press, where a bunch of papers have agreed we're all going to share content. But we're really, looking, we're really looking before that, right? When sharing is more uh, who you know, organic, and somehow that organic metaphor is maybe appropriate. I, I think that these viral models can help us to make systematic approaches to something that we tend to study at a very minute level. And I think that it helps the public connect to this sort of obscure historical research. And, and as evidence to that, I was going to brag just a little bit and say, we just got written up in Wired. 
<laughs> right? Uh, so our project, the, the Wired people were very interested in talking about it. And I actually think this kind of public outreach is really important, right? And I think because we call it viral, right, there's a kind of a hook that people who are not necessarily interested in 19th century literature, I know most people are interested in 19th century literature, <laughs> uh, can kind of hook in and see this thing that connects to their everyday lives, right? And then there are things that we can we can do with this, right? We can. I'm very interested in these sort of systemic ways of using these reprinted texts to figure out how print culture worked in the 19th century. We can map the spread of particular texts. We can compare the spread of different kinds of texts and see if there are interesting differences in the way that, say, poems were exchanged versus the way political news was exchanged, right? Um, just a few examples of that here. We, we can look at uh, these texts as sort of symbols of where the sort of print centers during the 19th century were. Where were people printing things that everyone else was reprinting, right? And we can even use this kind of uh, textual data to map uh, the 19th century print, uh, print as a network, right? Who are the publications that are printing the things that all the other publications want to print? Who are the sort of centers of print culture? And there are interesting uh, observations that come out of this. You begin to learn that there are papers in Nashville, Tennessee, and papers out in the Midwest, or actually what was at the time the West, who were fairly central to exchange. And literary scholars don't tend to look at those places. We tend to focus on New York and Boston and Philadelphia. And we're learning that the, the print network really depended on a lot of these more rural newspapers uh, for these kinds of exchange systems. Okay, but why not viral? Why is viral problematic? There are a number of reasons for that, too. And one of them is right here. I mean, when we talk about viral media, we tend to talk about a very personal kind of sharing. I see this thing, I share it with my friends, right? It has to do with social networks. Uh, but when we're looking at 19th century newspapers, we're still looking at edited content, right? There are editors who are making these decisions, who are in charge of these papers. And the kinds of exchanges are not happening organically among the general population, but among this very narrow band inside the population. It's also somewhat problematic, I think, because of time. When we talk about something going viral, we mean something that gets millions of clicks in a few days, right? It tends to be this incredibly brief time span. But even for our fastest uh, spreading stories, we're talking about months of spread. And some of these things that we're looking at spread over years or even decades, right? So they're stories that continue to be reprinted over these huge swaths of time, which I think don't quite line up with the way people use viral today. also problematic because we can't measure it at such a granular level, <laughs> right? We can actually say, we know that, you know, three million people at least looked at this photograph or looked at this story. We might not, they might have read it from end to end, but they at least looked at it. But there's no like button in the 19th century newspapers, right? And what we can know is that 50 papers printed this story, but it's impossible to know how many people actually read it, right? We can't measure it at that kind of granular level. And some of these papers had circulations of hundreds, some of these had circulations of thousands, and circulation data is actually really pretty difficult to get at for a lot of these newspapers. At the same time, so this, this uh, Robert Payne article is one that we read as a group, and he talks about like actually is itself kind of problematic because it's this binary. You click like, but by clicking like, you're signaling so many different possible things. You might be saying, I actually like this thing. <laughs> you might be saying, well, it's a picture of my nephew, so I better like it, or they're going to think I'm a bad aunt or uncle, right? Uh, you, you might just be sort of trying to increase the signal for a friend, right? There are all of these reasons that you might be liking something, and there's no way to dislike something. It's an on-off switch, right? So it's actually hard to glean too much meaning simply from likes. Although in some ways, reprinting is also a flat signifier, which is to say editors in the 19th century reprint things for all kinds of reasons as well. Sometimes they reprint things that they think are idiotic so that they can talk about how idiotic they are. Sometimes they reprint things that they really do like or that they want to share. So the big question always comes down to this idea of agency, right? People who don't like the viral metaphor don't, often don't like it because it sort of removes the human from the picture. It, it implies that things spread because they spread and removes the sort of conscious choices of people to spread things. Um, in some ways, the more I study this stuff, I don't know, the more complicated agency gets for me, which is to say there are all of these motivations beyond just liking, even in the 19th century, right? Uh, you could spread something because you like it. 
you could spread it because your colleagues are printing it. A lot of these 19th century papers are uh, they're Democratic papers or Republican papers or Baptist papers, and you could be printing it because all the other Democratic papers are printing it, right? Um, you could be printing it to say what a load of BS that is. You could be uh, trying to just demonstrate that you have a wide reach, printing things from all over the country, printing things from all over the world. You could be printing because you need to fill three inches in order to print your issue for the day, right? There are all of these reasons. And we also have a lot of evidence that editors spread things because their readers ask them to. Uh, we have these instances where an editor says, our readers have so repeatedly solicited us to republish this, so here it is, right? So the editor is not all controlling. So that's it, those are my problems, and I'm hoping we'll talk about them. <laughs> so before there was cultural virality, there were viruses. <laughs> Justin. A real scientist. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite. Um, so most of you probably don't know me, we haven't met. I'm Justin Andrides. Um I'm a biostatistician the Department of Health Sciences. So um, I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle um, and trying to maybe think about virality, viruses in a slightly different way. Um, and I want to talk about issues involving what I'm referring to as uncertainty in our data or uncertainty in our definitions or uncertainty just in general about we want, what we're looking for. I'm gonna use some work that I've been doing as sort of a backdrop for this and then at the end sort of tie it in with this, um, the more humanities, social science aspect of, of virality. But, you know, one thing that I think we've all mentioned so far is this definition of what it means to be viral. You know, it's an important definition when we talk about measuring things and comparing spread, you know, we have to be have, have a common baseline. We can't compare, talk about the virality of two things if we don't know what virality really means. Um, you know, is there a cutoff between something being viral and not being viral, right? Why did um, one um, act of sexual violence go viral and why did one not go vi viral? Well, what's the cutoff? At what, what point does one go viral? You know, how can we address these issues? And, and, and this is all getting at comparing viral spread. Now, I've put an interesting picture up here, um, mostly because this is going to be what I'll be talking about as my example. It's tuberculosis, which we're paying close attention to, is not a virus, it's a bacteria, right? But it spreads like a virally, right? Infectious, it's, it's an infectious disease, but it's not a virus, but we can talk about certain <laughs> spread of things. How do we describe the spread of viruses or the spread of disease or the spread of anything? Well, there's a couple different ways we can talk about it. One, the first thing is a term we call prevalence. It's just right now, a snapshot, how many people are exposed to this, how many people have this. How many people have seen the student bill rate video at this moment in time, right? So if we just take, at this time, three people, that's the prevalence, three out of however many. We can talk about the incidence, it's a, it's a rate. Uh, how many new cases? How many new people? Every day, how many people are seeing this video? What's it changing? This, that's sort of now more of a dynamic measure. And then another measure is this reproductive number, the person-to-person -person transmission, which says for every one person that is, is, has tuberculosis, how many people will they infect in a completely susceptible population? How many people will you forward this YouTube video along to? Okay. So these are things we talk about for diseases to sort of get an idea of the spread. We can compare diseases. Um, some very uh, influential, important, deadly diseases that people think may one day take over the world. Like there was a, I actually remember <coughs> seeing this time cover years ago when SARS first came out. Um, the reproductive number for SARS is only about two to four, but the problem was it was very deadly and there's no cure. And if everybody who contracts SARS spreads it to two to four people, well, it's gonna expand up and everybody's gonna get it. Um, but again, these are in susceptible populations and influenza, two to three people. But we can also see like some diseases are, are very highly contagious. We can compare how quickly something may spread in a susceptible population. See measles, 12 to 18. Well, why don't, why doesn't everybody have measles if it's so transmissible? Well, you know, we have, protections against that. We don't have susceptible populations because 
in theory, <coughs> we've all been vaccinated, or enough of us have been vaccinated. Um, interestingly enough, Boston sort of always pops up. You tend to have measles outbreaks every couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, the last one was in 2000, uh, yeah, 2013, September. Um, uh, we were up to 159 measles cases in Boston. And the problem, uh, I don't know if you remember, maybe it was about six years ago in the John Hancock, they had in one floor like 12 or 16 cases of measles, all because less people are sort of getting vaccinated against measles these days. So we're going to start seeing these things pop up. But they, they do return. They're, um, you know, we can we are interested in, in the dynamics of these spread these viruses. Um, so here are some other things that we think about as going viral. Um, <laughs> these are just some very uh, well. That's Psy from the Gangnam Style, and that's currently I think the most watched YouTube video um, to date. It was like a hundred and thirty million views, something like that. And then um, you know somewhere down. Way down the list is, is Susan Boyle, and she was something like 50 million views. And, and, um, and then this one I think is interesting. This is Jimmy Kimmel. He made a viral video. He literally he made a fake video. I don't know if you've heard the story of, of this girl twerking. And um, while she's twerking, she falls over onto a table with candles and catches on fire, and then the video cuts off. Um, well. Then they released the full video, which Jimmy Kimmel comes in at the end wearing the same thing as her and puts out the fire. And so it was this fake viral video that actually all they did was put it up on YouTube under a different account name and it spread and it went viral. And it got 14 million views, I think. And then the full video, once people realized that Jimmy Kimmel did it, the full video got 16 million views. <laughs> so it actually went potentially more viral, right? It got more views. Is that, can we say that was a, a more viral than the other? Right? It's, it's, now people know it's a fake video. They want to see the full thing. Was it the same? If it, was it somebody who already watched the video and then went back to see it again and then see Jimmy Kimmel at the end? Or was it like me, who I didn't see the first video because I'm like, that's stupid. And then somebody's <laughs> like, oh, it's a, it's a prank video. And I'm like, oh, well, then I'll watch it and see what it's all about. <laughs> um, you know, So I was one of the 16 million, but not one of the 14 million. Um, but again, what's the cutoff? Right? How far down the YouTube video list do you have to go before you say, like, well, this is not viral. Here's This video got this many hits, it went viral. This video got this many hits, it did not go viral. And I think one way we can talk about that is sort of how things are spread. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about tuberculosis, um, and more specifically, a very nasty form of tuberculosis called multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis. And, um, if there's one thing you walk out of here with today, it should be sheer terror about antibiotic resistant <laughs> diseases that will kill us all one day. Um, <laughs> NBR TB is a, a form of TB. It's, it's a resistance to two first line treatments uh, for tuberculosis. So people come down with tuberculosis, they put them on these drugs, and um, if they fail treatment for both of these drugs, they're resistant these drugs, they need to go on more extreme treatments, but they're considered drug resistant. Um, and tuberculosis is an interesting disease. I mean, most of the diseases that we have names for, we can cure. We know what causes them. Um, it's, it's a really good sign if a disease has a name. If it's named after the thing that causes it, like tuberculosis. It's a bad sign if it's named after somebody who has it. Um, <laughs> um, because if we know what causes it, we, we, we have a way to sort of fight it. But there's still a lot we don't know about tuberculosis. We don't still really know the, the mechanisms of transmission. We don't know things like that. And we don't know whether the burden of drug resistance is because people are failing treatment or whether people are transmitting drug-resistant tuberculosis from person to person. So if two people are in close contact and one of them has drug-resistant tuberculosis, are they transmitting drug-resistant tuberculosis or regular tuberculosis to a person? These are things we, we still don't really know, so we want to look at. Um, because we see for tuberculosis globally, you know, the incidence is dropping, which is a good thing. Incidence prevalence is going down. We're doing a good job of controlling tuberculosis worldwide because of some serious pushes by the WHO, World Health Organization. Um, but within each country, we see all different types of patterns of what's going on. And a lot of these patterns are affected by things like drug resistance. 
Um, the work I'm going to show you here is some work we did in Peru, looking at drug-resistant tuberculosis, where incidence of TB is dropping. So that's good. We're controlling tuberculosis in Peru. But incidence of drug-resistant tuberculosis is rising. Okay. So that just means sort of like of those TB cases, even though we're getting less TB cases, more of them are resistant to drugs, to, to first-line treatment. And that's a really bad thing. Um, so this is sort of affecting our ability to control this epidemic. And we need to figure out sort of where the burden of this disease is. Um, and more problems with drug-resistant tuberculosis is it's very difficult to test for. Um, it takes weeks to test people for drug resistance when there's a, when you don't have high-tech, cutting-edge labs. It involves growing cultures over, I think, three weeks and testing all of those cultures against these tests, uh, against these different drugs, and seeing which ones react and which ones don't. So you just can't test everybody. Um, so we test specific people. So we test people that have a known drug-resistant contact, we test people that have co-infection with HIV, we test people that have failed TB treatment before. And we try and whittle down the population with which we test. And even within those people, we can't test everybody. Because the prevalence of just tuberculosis in Lima, Peru is over 30%. So if this was, you know, first day of freshman seminar, you know, look to your left, look to your right, one of these people has tuberculosis. 30% is a lot of people, snapshot in time, of having tuberculosis. So we want to identify the sort of spatial variability of drug resistance so we can figure out where to go in and um, figure out where, trans where it's spreading, where the burden is coming from. And if we talk about where things are spreading, we want to look at where new cases are popping up, not where people are failing treatment. Um, so this is going to help us identify transmission hotspots, where transmission is occurring, where the virus is spreading, as opposed to where people are maybe failing treatment and getting drug resistance that way. Um, so that way we can go in, we can do interventions, and targeted interventions, uh, look at that. So the challenge here, and this is where I'm going to sort of start tying this together with what we've been talking about is this problem that not everybody gets tested for drug resistance. And we actually, of our almost, of our like 11, 12,000 tuberculosis <laughs> cases that we have in our study, only 10% of them have been tested for drug resistance. So if we were doing a normal study, and we just wanted to know about drug resistance, we'd be working with only 10% of our data. These are the only people that we have full data on. Um, we only have about 1,100 cases where we know their drug resistance status. And the rest of our 90% of our data, we don't know whether their cases are controls. So we don't know whether they've you know, been exposed to this <coughs> video or not. You know, we, don't, we don't know some information about this. Um, so how can we measure spread if we are missing so much information? And so what we've been doing is sort of trying to come up with methods to incorporate this incomplete missing data. Um, to get an idea of spread. And, and uh, you know, without getting too far into the methods, we come up with sort of ways to um, assign more weight to some people, less weight to other people, based on characteristics. So um, again, if you've previously failed retreatment, or previously failed tuberculosis treatment, we say you have a more of a chance of having drug resistance, so we give you a little more weight. And We've been looking at a whole bunch of different characteristics that are associated with drug resistance. Things that you might not think are characteristics associated with drug resistance, but are. People are showing things like diabetes. Um, whether you work in a manual labor job or whether you don't work in manual labor. Whether um, certain um, religious, uh, depending on like which uh, sort of religious sect you belong in, sort of how people gather, how people congregate. You know, these things are spread, transmitted through the air. Um, and just so we can use these different probability models to get different ideas of where things are spreading. If we just look at where we have all of our data, we get one picture. If we just randomly assign people to drug resistance, we get kind of a flat picture. There's nothing going on, as we might expect. And if we use some informative reassignment, we can get sort of a more informative picture of where um, transmission might be occurring. And this is all based on sort of supplementing incomplete data in an informative way. 
Um, so, you know, how, how can we do this? Well, first we want to identify a susceptible population. You know, where is this, what's the population within which this is spreading? So, you know, for instance, if we're talking about newspapers, are we talking about people who are reading newspapers? Are we talking about editors? Are we talking about cities? You know, can we define that? And then, what are, what are the, the um, uncertainties involved in our data? You know, we don't know, um, you know, I had an example when you were talking, we don't know, uh, oh, for instance, what's the cutoff in an article before we say this is the same article or this is a different article, right? If they're sort of, re you know, reprinted and things change. Well, obviously, there's something in our mind where if we look at two different articles, we know they're different. But how different do they have to be before we categorize those differently? So we can actually put sort of a probabilistic model on that. We can model these in different ways and come up with different pictures or different maps based on how we model these things, under what assumptions we make, how different two things have to be, um, how different two names have to be before we think an article is written by different people. Um, things like that. So that, that is sort of, um, that, that's my talk, and that's, that's what I'm here um, hoping to lend to the conversation, is sort of these questions that we have about um, virality and about whether to, one, one thing is viral and one thing isn't, or what's the cutoff, or how can we um, explain differences um, that, you know, maybe we can think of different models we can put on these and look at different ranges of scenarios. Um, and we can get lots of different pictures. So, thank you. Thank you. So we have about a half hour for conversation. I'm going to suggest that the three of you either pull up chairs or stand whatever makes you more comfortable. I mean, what? Yes, oh, my back hurts. I'll stand. <laughs> yeah, well, feel free to. I'll, I'll search call people and let's see how we can manage a conversation. Oh, yes. Hi. Those are three really interesting presentations. I thought it was really fascinating. And I have a question and a comment. I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment for Susanna. But I've been thinking a lot about the Delhi rape case. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a lot of friends who are among the activists who were participating in the right. protests in Delhi. And I've thought also a lot about this blaming the victim issue in the two cases. And I, I, I like your hypothesis about her having passed away, but the vigil started before she passed away. Yeah. That there had been about two weeks when she was in the hospital and they'd airlifted her, they brought her to Singapore um, before she passed away. And, um, and I think so much of it, I mean, one of the questions that has flummoxed a lot of people is why this case? Right. Delhi is a very unsafe place for women. And it's a place where you just know it when you're there and rape is so common there. Right. Why this case? And it sort of seemed as though it was the perfect configuration of an innocent female right. and very guilty men. And the fact and that they, they, found were, them, they found them immediately. Yeah. And, and they, they found was them immediately. And there was no doubt in anybody's right. mind that just how cut and dry, how her goodness and how she was a symbol of all things that her father had sold land in the village right. to send. She was this school. upward mobility, she so she becomes a symbol of that. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And that yeah. then, were then the, the yeah. males, and I think this really came across in a Guardian article that came out, yeah. in the, you know, that, that really talked about them as these unhinged, you know, sort of floating men that are sort of the disposable urban poor from the village. And it represented something um, that was just so base and makes the Indian middle class so uncomfortable right. that um, that it became very easy to you know to celebrate her and to victimize them and it started a whole other viral conversation that I think might be worth looking into in the Indian case about um, not all Indian men are rapists and right. a new discourse there was the the piece in the New York Times two weeks ago by a, yeah. a writer named Sankaran yeah. the, the good Indian man and then that started a whole set of yeah, that was responses to yeah. that that were so interesting. But thinking about sort of their, their class dynamic, whereas in the Steubenville Actually. case, they were all American boys. And they were, everybody had their hopes invested in them, whereas that story was more the narrative of the victim in the Delhi case. Right, I think that is a, is a part of it. And, and I think a lot was particularly, it wasn't just on their venality but on her purity. Yeah. I mean, she was very much a symbol of, you know, sort of India's ascendancy. Yeah. And she was this, you know, uh, you know, studying to be, I mean, she was studying and she was, you know, so it was very, it was very much that sort. But I, I mean, in some of the stuff I, I looked at around that, that was interesting, 
you know, there were a lot of feminist activists who were really pushing for there to be a more broader based discussion talk about, look, the police are raping us. Yeah. You know, the, I mean, this is not something, you know, refusing that, that very class and localized based narrative. Yeah. Um, and then there was all kinds of stuff about the country and the city, and you know there was a, it circulated in a lot of different ways. No, I don't think I don't think it's explained simply by that she was. Uh, I mean, I think there was one sort of hypothesis that you know she was the perfect victim because she was dead, and so then there wasn't a blame the victim. I think there are all these other circulating things, particularly about class. Yeah. Just I wonder if there's something to say about a, cu a culture reaching a kind of saturation point, like you know rape, 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 rape. But then this was like one rape too many, and it just exploded. Uh, yeah, so I, um, well, I can think about it from the other direction, the sort of desensitization. And I think that sort of has an effect on viral spread. But um, as far as the sort of one, the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, you know, the one too many, um, I don't, I, I want, I, it's an interesting, concept of sort of just the, the I mean it's like the, the tipping point right like that's yeah. what causes so much um, I, I think there's a yeah. there's probably a lot more that goes into it and I think these are the, the, the aspects that you're getting into and that you're you know of this you know, the, 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 the the victim who is sort of this promising young person and, and just just like the you know is it the worst I just like I'm wondering like, when an infection feel like becomes I'm getting a into a plague. Bad area here, but not to well, yeah, yeah. When it becomes a plague, and it yes, I'm not sure I have a comment on that, but I, I I'm interested in this question of where we can see the boundaries of a certain effect. In other words, you're describing right, right. a secondary virality or some you know an additional set of um, sequelae that result from a, from a sort of core event that we're interested in. And, I was struck by your point about sort of thresholds of visibility. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether, um, as you guys look at your viral phenomena, whether at some point it also becomes interesting to look at what one might describe as sort of secondary virality or um, the, you know, there's if, if, if virality is, a, is defined as something that spreads and you can identify that thing and it's sort of, you can think of it spread as a causal Propagation, like a wave that kind of spreads out from that center. It would be really interesting to know more about the kinds of things that are propagated by that wave, which right. are not the same as that wave, right? Mm -hmm. right? And I, I mean, I can see applications in all of your cases, but I wonder if that's something that you look at or have time to look at. Well, there was, I mean, the It Gets Better is a great example of that because there was this, you know, this initial thing that then had very similar other form, I mean, more it gets better, you know, more of those. But then there became this sort of, you know, secondary virality that was that was both visual and narrative, um, you know, critiquing it, critiquing the class and racial politics of it, making, you know, we got your back, and all these other, you know, make it better, so that became other projects that were riffing on both, both the problems they saw with that, but also uh, on, on the sort of question of virality itself, and then it became parodied, and you know. So I do think there were. I mean, what what was true is that, I mean, and, and this is where the the India case is just so so different and so interesting in that is that the the virality also had social movement effects, you know. So that the I mean, it didn't end with a, what what I find finding with both it it gets better largely and with the Steubenville is that it, that it's recursive. Right, so that the virality creates other viralities and in a mediated form, but that it doesn't, it's not seeping into or, or exceeding the <coughs> mediation. That it, you know, so that social, move, social movements, qua social movements, are sort of you know, a, a, a secondary, really a secondary effect, tangentially related, where that's not the case with what happened in India. I mean, it really did set off what you might call a public discourse. At, at, that was that was embodied and that was um, that was virtual. That was both. Whereas with these things, it sets off not a public discourse, but more more virality. You know, which says something I think about U.S. popular culture. Well, I, I also think it has to do with this sort of concept of the susceptible population and, mm -hmm. and who is um, either at risk for the disease or who is now part of this spread. And if we think about the it gets better. 
like the susceptible, you know, 50, whoever sees the It Gets Better campaign, they've seen it. Now if you start talking about the parodies that it spreads, those are, those secondary sort of spreads are only gonna happen within those people who have seen It Gets Better. Mm -hmm. Because if you haven't seen the original, the parody doesn't right. matter to you, right? And this is the same thing that we've talked about in some right. other cases, and, and it's the same thing with, you know, we're wondering if that's the same thing with something like tuberculosis, if you think about the secondary spread being multiple drug resistance, you know, is it just spreading within people who have tuberculosis or is it popping up in new people? Um, and that, that's one thing that, that could be different. And so when we're thinking about the effect of some of a, of a viral effect of some uh, event that might be viral, I think it's also a matter of who could be affected by this, what is the susceptible population. And, um, you know, I think uh, that what sort of Facebook and Twitter and, and all of us, you know, being constantly connected with our phones has sort of just increased our ability to be part of the susceptible population of mm -hmm. any sort of social event that goes on. Mm -hmm. And it just makes it easier for us to get updates of what's happening with the stupid bill rape case and us to see, you know, people are retweeting these awful things that people are saying and yeah. that people are retweeting these wonderful things that people are saying and, you know, you just, you become involved in it. So, so I get really excited when, I, when we find a parody version of one of our poems, especially there are a lot of parodies of the widely spread poems. Um, because, again, reprinting is something of a flat signifier, but when something is reprinted, it tells me something more. Mm -hmm. Or some, when something is parodied, it tells me yeah, that it was familiar enough to enough people that one could write a parody and expect people to like that mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that does happen occasionally. I, I know you've uncovered a few here, the work you've done, uh, where you find a, a parody that's sort of mixed in with the, the reprints that are found, and that's very exciting. The, the other thing I was gonna say, though, is that a lot of the viral text that we're finding are condensed versions of kind of literary conventions that we would be familiar with. And they are themselves kind of um, remediations of familiar tropes. So a lot of them are these really super condensed uh, domestic tales that borrow an awful lot from like the long sentimental 19th century novel. And so in some ways their virality seems to be also about the way that they're taking very familiar tropes and, um, and playing, and playing with them, so the, the audience doesn't need to sort of learn something new in order to understand them, right? Um, so, so they are themselves, in some ways, rehashing of other ideas, a lot of them, a lot of them are. So, um, I'm gonna make an attempt to connect to what everybody talked about. So I'm really interested in this question of the secondary virality, as it has to do with the ways in which these sort of less controlled viral spaces, like Twitter and the internet, influence these more traditional um, sort of role-based viral spaces like journalistic spaces. So I'm thinking about the ways in which we see now stories or memes or whatever go viral online and then within a 24-hour cycle you see journalists who are have been trained to follow certain rules that sort of limit them or are supposed to limit them in terms of like how they de define news or you know, use language, picking up these things, and then you see through the news cycle, those things going viral in the news cycle, and you see journalist after journalist after journalist after journalist repeating what started as somebody's snarky comment on Twitter, right. you know, about whatever. And it seems like this really interesting moment where you have these non-official um, spaces creating the virality and then influencing these formal and official narratives. Um, that's not really a question, but like I just think it's sort Well, of like except what was interesting, yes, I agree, but what was interesting to me in really tracking the Steubenville mm -hmm. thing was that there was this image of it as being holy and everything written about it afterwards is this is a, this is a social, the, the case, there's one article after the case that social media made, the convictions, that's, and in fact, the New York Times article preceded Anonymous. You know, and preceded the virality of that 12-minute video, which was so horrific. So, you you know, I, I think I mean that's that's of interest to me. I'm not sure what to make of it. That that we are sort of willfully not we we are willfully making this a social more of a social media moment than than in fact maybe it is. I mean, the the, the fact is no one really realizes that the parents took these, this image, this stuff, to the police two days afterwards. 
These kids were picked up a couple days after that, way before all of this stuff started circulating, and particularly before these hackers started getting all the, the tweets out and getting the videos out. So, but that to me says something that we, that, that, so that we, I think we're more eager to comment on this socially as a social media event than we are but does that eager to comment on it as a political more, event. Journalists are more eager to cover it once it becomes a social media event than when it was already, you know, it was already happening, but the but formal journalism wasn't covering it to the same extent that they decided to cover it once yes. people on the internet got upset. Yes, but, but but then but but then what happened in sort of the secondary is now when people look back and write these sort of summation pieces, what did we learn from Steubenville? All they talk about is what we learned is how social media creates. Right. Um, you know, uh, shown the light. You know, was shining the light on the, on this on this horrible thing. And in fact, sort of the you know the family, the parents, the girl, the embodiment, the New York Times disappears right. in that narrative. And, and in fact, I think I mean my argument is you know that in some ways the crime disappears. All right. So that 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 violence against women in some ways disappears because it becomes a story about social media. But that's not what happened in India, mm -hmm. right? Which is interesting. So. I think it's okay. Ahead, I mean, when you look at the press before the Civil War, it's a really different beast than the press today, or the press, especially you know, 20 years ago. Which is to say, like one could not go to school for journalism in the 1840s, <laughs> right? And a lot of the conventions that we sort of associate with journalism don't really exist in the period that we're studying, or they're just sort of coming into being. Um, so you know, again, most well, in some ways, Fox News and MSNBC are a return to form. Which is to say, most of these are explicitly partisan. Um, they are often don't actually have journalists. They have an editor, like one guy who does the whole newspaper, mm -hmm. and he's not trained in journalism. He's a writer who just decided to put together a paper. Um, so it, it's when I read a 19th century newspaper, it feels a lot more to me like a blog, <laughs> an aggregator, than it feels like the modern New York Times. Um, although you see glimmers of the things that will become yeah. the New York Times down the road, um, but it feels very different in character. Um, so while it is official, it's official, but it's it's somehow <coughs> less official than we tend to think of the news as being. Well, two questions. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, I'm I'm interested in things that might fall under the head of secondary virality, but m I want to maybe give another metaphor for them, uh, which, which again is you know, abusing terminology, may maybe an epigenetic metaphor <laughs> for secondary virality, <laughs> in that if, if we're really not just interested in individual events like Steubenville, but what one of these episodes does to change the population, Maybe that's mm -hmm. what's underlying a lot of these things. Or, I mean, these could be cultural effects, right? The, the spread of a particular kind of religious organization leads to different kinds of, uh, of cultural pathways through which these, uh, through, through which these diseases can, uh, can propagate. So is there, a, a, and this is also, I think this is most visible in you know, the, the, the 19th century data with uh, the sort of long time spans for some of these texts, right? That once a new population comes up who's, you know, who, who's not inoculated to the charms of uh, John Greenleaf Whittier, it you know, spreads like wildfire through the population again. Um, who, who can it? Yes, I know. He's uh, right. He's the, he's the retrovirus of the 19th century. Just, right. Uh, but um, so, so I wonder if rather than thinking about the rather than centering on the virality of the texts, is there some interesting commonality in all of this work? Uh, if you, if the central object instead becomes properties of the population, whether it's just susceptibility uh, to a single kind of event like tuberculosis or whether it's you know all kinds of genetic predispositions or cultural uh, cu cultural phenomena that can be changed by the layering one upon another of you know one social media story telling a social media is important after another you know, can I on that because I was thinking of other effects too like you know washing your hands um, that where a population will change its behaviors because of a phenomenon that becomes widely known, and and how med, and how the fact of social media and people um, taping and transmitting things when they might not know that they will be seen later will change um, youth culture. You know, if, if kids will feel more warned against doing something that can be 
Um, well, it's interesting to say because actually a lot of the stuff after Steubenville, there was this, you know, because there was this spate of other uh, of other events that were similar, and you know, there there became this reporting on it that that they, again that the problem is not the sexual violence. Yeah. The problem is these kids don't know not to, t yeah. you know, yeah. not to. It, was like, it wasn't don't rape, it was don't, 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 stop don't it. post it, you know. Like so actually it was really don't, terrifying. Yeah. It was, there was this whole, you know, there was article after article where people say, you know, kids these days, boy, really they like just rape. go, they just yeah. keep, you know, raping and posting it, you know? <laughs> and better, you know, they should know how to use their social media better <laughs> and not to, you know, so, it, but but I, that's what I mean when I say, I mean, you laugh, but it's really horrible, right? But yes. I mean, that's what I mean when I say when the virality in the media became the story. So that, so that, you know, I actually would say when you talk about, you know, the sort of epigenetic in that way, I wonder, if, if there's a way in which it's not about a second order virality, but a way in which that kind of virality inoculates a population to the social. Mm -hmm. You know, whether, whether there's a way in which it distances us from actually the ability to reckon with these as re embodied social problems. So I, I found myself wondering, like, what, my if, what if we had had this, you know, when, when all these, you know, priests were engaging in behaviors that stayed secret for, decades and decades if you know if if you had this kind of mechanism that would have changed how much would have changed I mean that I don't know um, but epigenetics <laughs> of those of you a question Robert? I just had a, a question about I mean could you talk about how the the social media aspect and the virality became a story in Steubenville have you thought about actually doing sort of some mapping or, or data analysis of the language that she used in the stories mm -hmm. to. I would love. I mean, I would have to get someone's help uh, in yeah. doing that. Because I, mean, it's, 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 I don't do that. I'm a and like just finding person. like the distinction because it, it's it's difficult for me to wrap my head around yeah. sort of like I, I definitely I find the idea that like the victims are made invisible compelling, but it, it'd be interesting to see the actual language yeah. itself. And yeah, I mean, the, what I've seen so far is just I mean is sort of. Um, you know what what gets posted on websites, what gets posted on blogs, what gets in the newspaper. In other words, tracking how we now you know the stories that are uh, sort of post Steubenville, talking you know what we have learned from this, and they're largely about you know about this. We've learned about social media, not what we've learned about the prevalence of sexual violence or about masculinity. Or about you know, there's a little bit about that in 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 explicitly feminist sites, obviously, mm -hmm. pushing it that way. But but there's not. But it would be interesting to sort of track how that you know to track it in a more I think if you look at, at news media coverage of the Arab Spring, you would find the same thing though. Like instead of being like, here's what we learned about dictators in right. the Middle East and how right. long people are willing to be oppressed by them, it's like here's that we learned that people in the Middle East have computers too and <laughs> know how to use them to tweet, like you know, so. Well, so it's interesting then to ask the question, so at what <coughs> point, I mean, is that a product of social media qua social media, or at what point does, does something push through, you know, in some way so that it's not able, which is some of what I'm seeing in India, so that it actually does, you know, infect the public discourse, that it actually, becomes not recursive, but but pushes outside of the parameters of discussing itself to, to raising, you know, sort of a Changing national legislation. You know, because this legislation was amazing. I mean, all of a sudden it's like, boom, 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 here's this now. Is it going to change the culture? Whatever, that's all other question. But I mean, there was actually this sort of pragmatic, political, legal steps taken in response to, uh, you know, an atrocity. So do you think it's because of the how sort of still to a large percentage of the population how novel sort of social media as a tool of um, spreading, as a tool of justice, as a tool of spreading information is, and that you know the next Arab Spring that's done via Twitter will not, the story won't be yeah. Twitter, it'll be the Arab Spring, or is it just always going to be something new? Is there gonna be you know the Vine revolution? All the Vine videos, <laughs> and it'll be all how Vine yeah. is influencing, or, or um, yeah. you know, was this when when um, you know sit-ins and take back the night marches? You know, was the the in the <coughs> first ones was the story the the march, or was the story about the, the legislation? And then when does that when right. did that sort of shift over? Well, the story about the TV cameras and cell like the, there was yes. that same meta narrative right. still existed. Mm -hmm. then. Yeah, yeah. So, but then you know, eventually people yeah. become you know used to that as a form of 
learning about things, and, and then it's, you know, what are we actually learning about, hopefully, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, mean, I was just going to tie that into the fascination in the US with that meta narrative of how is the story told, how is right. this ties well into what you were saying about the US being obsessed with technological progress right. as being its you know primary source of discussion is that how is this new, what you know that needs to be the story of how something's new has to be there and also who's telling the story within CNN. There's also this sort of panic within that structure that they're not leading the story mm -hmm. and so the story for them becomes how are we not leading the story how right. do we come to control this story how do we you know and i think that viral that that's our wanting point. to grab yeah. onto viral comes out of that difficult that challenge with the structural shift that we're looking at between who gets to report and whose voice gets to who, who gets to be the echo chamber um, and how do we manage how does that sphere become managed right um and i think that's one of the things that's really interesting with bringing in the um actual study of disease into this like how does the virality metaphor and our research tend towards thinking about acquiring apparatuses of management you know uh, right. in the same way that you're you're looking at this pre-professional period of newspapers and that that became something with with management structures to it like our is the very existence of us in a meta-narrative sort of way a, a grappling with management of this space right. um and then in thinking on that, I, I, I do worry about the flattening of the viral metaphor that, we, that we're that we doing because we're drawing on social media cases where we tend to focus on spread rather than actual characteristics of viruses. Um, you know, like, what if I, how, and we talked about this in, in our right. meetings, how viruses actually biologically operate and why we don't go to those metaphors as easily, but we tend to focus on the metaphors of spread. I think, I, I think that's just an artifact of using the word viral and I think because it's catchy, and I mean, I'm sure we probably got into who was the first to use the, the, the metaphor of viral, but I mean, really what we're talking about is more, a, a, I think infectious is a better metaphor. I mean, it's just, or, or transmission or something like that, but it's not as catchy as viral, it's not as catchy as viral marketing. It's, um, but you know, tuberculosis isn't a viral disease, it's a bacteria. A lot of, <laughs> you know, we talk, a lot of things that spread are not viruses, and, and you know, um, so, but we, we talk about viral spread, and, and, and really we're talking about just person-to-person, person-to-person transmission, or you know whatever node you want in the network. It could be again, it could be editor to editor, or or newspaper to newspaper, it's, or you know um, whatever sort of uh, how things spread from different social media networks to mass media networks. Um, you know whatever sort of transmission you're in. So, so viral media is out, and it's infectious, infectious media. media. Yeah. I think that's so the you're actually. like, we're going off to the rebrand. <laughs> interested in talking about, about infections, because clearly one of the reasons that viral has such resonance yeah. was also because of the fears of computer viruses, yeah. right? yes. not just and of disease viruses. But, uh, and it, another sort of interesting yeah. thing, and this is something that's sort of talked about a lot, is also, you know, Viral now for a lot of people is a positive thing. They want their message to go viral. They want the marketing to be viral. Um, viral for you know what I do is not a good thing. I'm trying. To, <laughs> we're trying to That's we're trying to limit the spread, and it was, we're studying spread so we can limit it, so we can figure out how it's spreading so that we can contain it. And we're not interested in how is this spreading so we can replicate how that spread. <laughs> how I how Jimmy Kimmel can make a YouTube video that spreads. Like he he looked at what you needed to make a YouTube video spread virally, and he made that, and it worked. Um, you know, can you look at what makes YouTube videos spread virally and then find some way to remove that from our culture? We'd probably, we'd get a, all get a lot more work done. That's <laughs> <laughs> one and two, yeah. Your point about CNN, I think, opens up a really interesting distinction between um, infected nodes that are vectors for future infection and <laughs> infected nodes that are just interesting qua infection. In other words, the the, the thing that's distinct, the thing that's different between CNN and me having seen that video is that CNN can be a mode of transmission in a different way. In other words, it's it has the capacity to comment on and hasten and respond to willingly to become a, a further vector of, of transmission. In other words, it operates to sort of magnify the transmission. And I think it'd be really interesting to look at, I mean, I think this is getting back to also what David was saying about um, uh, what was the phrase you used? 
Well, that's maybe, maybe you should maybe you should nip this in the bud before it goes. Yeah, I don't know. Before it goes <laughs> and it was about um, it, uh, susceptibility of populations. In other words, or, well, it's how not just that the are changed fire, by. Well, the, right. I mean, right. in other words, it's not just that we kind of passively sit here and all of us see the videos and then we respond equally. It's that some people, when they see the video, they respond with hate mail, and some people, when they see the video, respond with you know. I heart so and so, and some people when they see the video think, how can we get out on top of this news story? And I think looking at the different ways that different infected nodes respond mm -hmm. to to infection affects how they then serve as further vectors of propagation, and that would be interesting. Sorry that took yeah. so long. And it's both institutional and personal. I mean, that's what I was fascinating with some of the Steubenville because this one character, this Alexandria Goddard, who was this sort of weird blogger who broke a lot of this stuff and kept pushing it, has a checkered past and history and relationship to the media, relationship to the town. She's not truthful in everything she says all the time. She, you know, clearly is trying to put herself as the kind of, you know, brave, brave voice of this, but she's also quite manipulative. So, and she's an you know, just an individual who, you know, be this became her mission. Um, you know, then then there's the whole uh, you know the edifice of, of something like CNN, which you know uh, it, which in fact you know is up against her in some ways in a in a you know contestatory way. It'd be so. interesting to you know sort of think about what would have been different in that case if um, you know we have the sort of the Delhi case where the whole social media response was <coughs> what we would consider to be a positive response in, in what we would think would be a positive but, manner. And in the stupid bill of rape case, we had some positive response, and we had some negative, very negative response of all the shaming, the victim shaming, the victim blaming. Well, what if the stupid bill rape case didn't have any of the positive? What if it was all, right. the entire social media response was victim blaming? Would sort of the conclusion of, of this case have been the same? Would, would things have unfolded the same way? Right. And maybe that's an interesting sort of way to look at the effect of social media on this, is to say, you know, what if we didn't have one side right. of the story on social media. Mm -hmm. th th this is interesting too because so we have evidence of some authors getting very upset when they know their work is being reprinted in newspapers. Mm -hmm. We have other evidence of authors who try to exploit the system. They would send their work to multiple papers in mm -hmm. hopes that it would get reprinted. Mm -hmm. um, Fanny Fern, who was a very well-known journalist in the 19th century, she wrote a novel it's basic. It's a very autobiographical novel, but the, the main character in the novel gets very excited when she hears that her work is being printed in the exchanges, um, because that means she's getting a name, she's getting a reputation. Um, but the editors themselves depended on that system, actually. There's some uh, arguments that say, basically, there could never have been thousands of newspapers in the 19th century without this system <coughs> of exchange, because you know, one editor in some you know, town in the middle of Ohio doesn't have enough content to print a daily paper but if he's getting all of this information from everywhere and he's just borrowing it, he can assemble a daily paper, right? And actually sort of do the work. And so he has a very different relationship to these stories than do the authors whose work is circulating uh, than do the readers, we would assume. So that's, that's an interesting way to, to think about this. One more comment question. Um, being an undergrad, it's very interesting to hear every, all of, like academics talk about Twitter and social media and Instagram when I've grown up with this throughout high school and it's completely warped the way I view the news and journalism Shape. and everything. Yeah. <laughs> and so I guess my, what, what you talked about in your presentation was um, how people will talk about it gets better and then there's all of these branches of that and then you talked about the susceptible population, how it keeps within that. And I saw your, the hashtags, I'm sure like that's how you search to see all, find all of these tweets. And for me, I remember sitting in class when Newtown occurred, and I just read my feed, and they were all, pray for Newtown this and everything like that, and it, it's this faux sense of community for me mm. that people believe they're so attached to these hor horrific events, and you know, you have, I don't know, you, you just, you have these people who are attached to it, and you get the It Gets Better campaign, but there's, it's only such a small population when you look at the virality of how, like all the retweets and how you're saying there's no, there's different significance to likes and retweets and all things like that. I just think it's, for me, it's very difficult to have this whole concept of virality when, for me, it doesn't mean anything. When it's when it's like all of these retweets and all of these likes and everything, that they're so meaningless to me that it's very hard for me.
me to grasp how all this research is based on that. And like, I appreciate it, it's very interesting to me, but it's, it's just very hard for me to grasp. Well, I think you're right about this notion of the sort of faux community. I mean, one, one of the things about some of these, um, you know, something like it gets better, I mean, one, one can make an argument, and people have made the argument, that, you know, phenomena like that sort of create the illusion of a kind of gay positivity. And, uh, you know, the end of anti-gay animus because, you know, 50,000, 50 million people watch an It Gets Better video and the president says, it does get better, and, you know, Miley Cyrus says, it gets better, and everyone says, it gets better. And so then everyone feels, oh, we've done, we've done it, you know, and that's the end of, right. That's, yeah, that's the end of the, you know, that's the movement, we've wrapped it up. And I think that's, you know, I mean, that is the whole other aspect of some of the social, of, of the use of social media in the relationship to social change. You know, to what extent does it actually disempower people to build real communities uh, because they feel they've done, they've tweeted their community out of themselves. <laughs> so they, there's no need to, and I think that's a real, uh, you know, and it's a hard question to get at the answer to that. You know? Um, so what, what community are you really involved in? Are you, are you the community online and right. in the Twitter sphere, or are you the community that's actually trying to make action? And there's such a discontent between the two, I feel like, for at least my generation. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that to me was one of the interesting things about the India case, because there wasn't the disconnect as much. We could go on and on. <laughs> um, think about space and place. Um, and thank you all so very much.